Today is May 11th, 2020. This video is intended to show the close links between the UFO phenomenon and the science, physics, and technology of UFOs. As opposed to the idea that this phenomenon is just a rumor or a paranormal phenomenon, this video provides strong arguments in favor of the hypothesis that extraterrestrials are coming to planet Earth. In particular, uh, this is addressed to Lou Elizondo, Christopher Mellon, Robert Bigelow, Tom DeLong, Jacques Vallée, Leslie Keane, Steven Spielberg, and James Cameron. My name is Jean-Pierre Petit. I'm a French scientist, retired but still active. I have several specialties. My first is fluid mechanics. My second, plasma physics. I have also published work in the field of astrophysics and cosmology. As a scientist, I became interested in the UFO phenomenon in 1975. What follows will explain why. Since 1965, I carried out uh, theoretical and experimental research in magnetohydrodynamics, MHD for short. The starting point was the production of electrical energy using MHD generators. In this picture, you can see the test bench I built in 1965 at the Institute uh, the of mechanics, uh, fluid mechanics in Marseille. It's a plasma cannon. Like all guns, it has a breech. Here it is. This cannon fires a burst of plasma that runs along the tube at three kilometers per second. It then passes through an MHD nozzle with a constant linear cross section which is flanked by two solenoids that create a very strong transverse magnetic field, two Teslas. The interested reader will find on the internet the principle and description of the MHD generator, which transforms the kinetic energy of a plasma into electricity without any moving parts. This direct conversion of kinetic energy into electricity results in the slowing down of the gas. In spite of the very substantial resources in some countries, particularly Russia, the attempts to develop this technology were a failure. This is a model of the huge Russian U-25 installation that operated near Moscow in the 70s. In the French MHD generator, the MHD nozzle was the size of a beer can. By comparison, here is the nozzle of the Russian MHD plant, and it's 2,000 ton magnet. Uh, this is the inside of the nozzle. To the right and left are the electrodes. In this Russian installation, the gas temperature did not exceed 1,200 degrees. Technological constraints seriously limited this temperature. As the electrical conductivity of the plasma depends very strongly on its temperature, exponentially it remained very limited. It is this constraint that led towards the end of the 70s to the abandonment of the formula and the industrial uh, pretensions. In contrast, the French installation had been designed to operate with a plasma temperature of 10,000 degrees, which gave it a very high electrical conductivity. The conversion efficiency of my kinetic energy into electrical energy was therefore high. In contrast, in the Russian installation, the efficiency was very low. In the mounting I had designed, 
I had eliminated the technological problems by limiting the running time to 50 millionths of a second. Therefore, this facility was not an industrial project, but it had the advantage of being able to study the electrical conversion process under conditions that no other facility in the world could offer. This very high conversion efficiency led to a very sharp reduction in speed to the point where a shock wave was generated. A flat shock wave was building up in the constant section nozzle. My laboratory was the only one where this effect could be produced. In concrete terms, this meant that a shock wave could be created in a gas without any material obstacle. The obstacle simply being electromagnetic forces. Hence the following remark. Here is an object. It's a stapler. I can take this stapler and use some energy to put it down here. I think the same energy I'll be able to pick it up and take it away. Let's go back to the diagram of our MHD experience. This is the supersonic nozzle on its own. In this supersonic flow, I place an object that is like a small aircraft wing. A system of four oblique flat shock waves will therefore be installed around the object. Then an idea emerged. Inside this flow of ionized gas, and by creating a field of electromagnetic forces around this model, such that the magnetic field and the electrical intensity of the current flowing around the model have values comparable to those that had caused a plane shock wave to appear. Could the shock wave be prevented from occurring around this small object immersed in the supersonic gas flow? This idea was initially presented in a paper presented to the Academy of Sciences of Paris in 1975. It was progressively refined in a series of papers presented before the Paris Academy of Sciences. Here in, is one in 1977. Here's another presented in 1980 and another following in 1981. The underlying theoretical concept is gradually being developed, which results in fluid mechanics free of shock waves, thanks to complete control by an electromagnetic force field. In this picture, you see what specialists call Mach waves. It is their collision that causes the shock waves to appear. Uh, you, you'll see these in pink. MHD avoids the collision between these waves and makes the shock waves disappear. A third fluid mechanics thus is emerging. First, the subsonic fluid mechanics where there were no shock waves. Then there is the mechanics of supersonic fluid flow where shock waves necessarily appear. And now that constitutes a real revolution in the supersonic fluid flow mechanics controlled by MHD where shock waves are prevented from appearing. For flying machines, these shock waves are not only noisy, they also require more energy to move forward. And from Mach 4, 5, they build an impenetrable wall of heat. We tried in France in the 80s to demonstrate this possibility of making shock waves disappear in a hot gust of gas. Unfortunately, however, we did not have the testing facilities to carry out this experiment. Since the waves created by ships are the equivalent of shock waves, the speed of propagation of surface waves being the equivalent of the speed of sound, it becomes possible to regulate the flow using appropriate parameter values. But due to electrolysis, the current in the water is limited to one ampere per square centimeter. 
This result then requires a high magnetic field in the, on the order of one Tesla. MHD offers the possibility of suppressing turbulent wake, which has been shown as early as 1976 downstream of a cylindrical obstacle. This result can be extended with another configuration for spherical objects. In fluid mechanics, the two sources of noise are, uh, as a rule, turbulence and supersonic shock waves. To the extent that witnesses say they observe total silence, the link with the UFO phenomenon is becoming more and more obvious. MHD machines are surrounded by plasma. When they are equipped with electrodes, the increased brightness in the vicinity of the electrodes make them appear like portholes, which is consistent with witness accounts. The shapes of these devices, called MHD aerodynes, are determined by the laws of physics as plasmas subjected in, to strong magnetic fields. They no longer have anything to do with the shapes of classic flying machines. Uh, around such machines, the fluid is no longer left to fend for itself. As in the figure to the left, penetration into the fluid is accompanied by a shock wave and very strong turbulence. Figure to the right, the flow rate is in total contradiction with the classical laws of fluid mechanics. This fluid is obliged to obey the imperative orders given to by the electromagnetic force field acting on it. Everything in such flying machines may seem absurd. For example, this is what you get when you implement a microwave ionization control system. The result is a system of microwave arcs that witnesses will describe as truncated rays of light. For years, publications in high-level, peer-reviewed scientific journals and papers at major international conferences have followed one another. Here is a doctoral thesis on the suppression of shock waves, which was defended in 1988. The thesis, uh, which presents all the theoretical elements of the suppression of shock waves by electromagnetic forces. A thesis uh, which was also uh, on the subject of publication uh, in the high-level journal, the European Journal of Mechanics in 1988, accompanied by the presentation at the MHD International Symposium in Tsukuba, Japan. Everything is centered on the essential idea of maintaining the parallelisms of the Mach waves. This presentation and publication was accompanied by a mass of results, both theoretical and experimental. Here we have the obtaining of spiral electric currents. Here you have the first presentation of the concept of suppression of Velikov's ionization instability by magnetic confinement. A presentation that was made at the MHD International Symposium in Moscow in 1983. Here is the experimental confirmation of this concept. This is a major achievement. Indeed, without such a system, there would simply be no MHD for moderate temperature plasmas subjected to a very strong magnetic field. Plasmas are very difficult to control. When you create uh, an electric shock from a rounded object, um, magnetic pressure tends to blow it away from the object. It was therefore necessary to create the concept of parietal confinement by inversion of the magnetic field gradient, which was experimentally confirmed. Here is the corresponding scientific publication in the Polish journal Acta Physica Polanka. I am not going to detail all the experimental results that have been obtained and that work has been published in uh, high-level journals for almost four decades. The central issue remained the annihilation of shock waves by the MHD. During the 80s, the hot blast wind tunnel where this experiment could have been carried out no longer existed. It had been dismantled. It would have been necessary to recreate an MHD lab where this mounting could have been reconstructed. Alas, it was not possible. It is true that in France, the desire to innovate is more of a handicap than an advantage. 
MHD's research has therefore been totally abandoned in France. Does this mean that it has been the same in other countries? No, it doesn't. We had proof of this in 2018 when President Putin presented Russia's new weapons to delegates from his assembly, the Duma. In this arsenal, we find the Kinzhal air-to-air missile with a range of 2,000 kilometers operating at Mach 10, and a hypersonic avant-garde glider uh, capable of very large trajectory deviations when it dives towards its target, launched by the Samarat missile with an approach speed corresponding to Mach 30, it is like the Kinzhal missile, totally out of reach of current anti-missile systems. It is extremely simple. If they are, were not equipped with MHD shock wave suppression devices, these devices, at the speeds they were supposed to be traveling at, would immediately vanish into thin air. But to do MHD, you need electricity. For both the Kinzhal and the avant-garde engines, what would be the source of electrical power. At the beginning and during an international symposium of MHD in the United States, I had discussed it with two Russian researchers. It was apparent that the Russians had ended up in the so-called Pavlovsky generators. The use of the ejection gases from the powder rocket at high temperature and enrichment with cesium, which gives them good electrical conductivity. It is then possible to configure the diverters of these powder rockets as MHD generators. An ingenious self-exciting system makes it possible to obtain high magnetic field values. The limited service life of the walls and electrodes does not pose a problem for devices such as the Kinzhal or the Russian high-velocity MHD torpedo. So that's the secret of the Kinzhal air-to-air missile. The avant-garde missile is a glider. Its source of energy is therefore gravity. A high-voltage current generator is therefore placed on its flanks. This energy makes it possible to regulate the flow on the front part by limiting the heat flow. This corresponds to the MHD bypass system described in the 1988 thesis. Besides that, would the Russians have carried out retroengineering by taking seriously the UFO sightings reported by witnesses? The fact remains that the UFO phenomenon prompts scientists to venture outside the conceptual field of their time. like envisaging a supersonic movement in the air without creating a shock wave uh, and turbulence, uh, i.e. silence. For more information, please refer to the, this video, which I've identified here. The hypothesis that UFO sightings correspond to extraterrestrial visits leads us to reconsider the problem of the feasibility of interstellar travel. The Janus cosmological model is the result of 30 years of reflection on the subject. You will be able to refer to the French version of the Janus model uh, or its dub version in your language at the above address. Here's a summary. According to this model, if one wants to move from point A to point B, if the moving object is made of positive mass and its speed is limited to 300,000 kilometers per second, the speed of light. On the other hand, if this object is made of negative mass, for example, if it represents a vehicle and its passengers whose mass would have been reversed, then this speed limit is increased to 3 million kilometers per second. That is to a value 10 times higher. In this Janus universe between two points A and B, there are two ways to calculate the distance. For this, I'll refer you back to the video I cited previously. If one moves from point A to point B using positive mass, 
vehicle, the distance is then AB plus. If you are now traveling uh, in a vehicle with negative mass, the distance is AB minus 100 times shorter. By combining these two values, we find that the travel time can be reduced by a factor of 10 times 100, i.e. a factor of 1,000. Assuming that the mass inversion technology is ma mastered, when mass inversion is performed, this vehicle and its passengers appear to disappear from view. It seems to dematerialize. Once uh, it has reached its destination, all it has to do is to perform a new mass inversion to return to this positive world. And he seems to appear out of nowhere. Let's imagine a vehicle on an interstellar cruise. Here, it's reversed its mass, so it's evolving in a world of negative mass, ultra-rarefied. At distances of hundreds of millions of light years, one sees immense clouds of, made of antimatter, antihydrogen, and negative mass helium. Spheroidal, they are comparable to immense protostars emitting light faintly in the red and the infrared. If it reverses its mass again, the negative mass cloud disappears and the stars become visible to it again. Like a submarine resurfacing, the interstellar vehicle can then locate itself on different radio sources and take stock of the situation, possibly to adjust its trajectory before carrying out a new mass inversion. According to the Janus model, this negative world, uh, i.e. this side of the universe, is extremely rarefied. While cruising in the negative world, the vehicle is made of negative mass material. On its way, it will encounter very rare particles made of antimatter of negative mass. It will therefore need to protect itself with a magnetic shield uh, in the same way that the Earth protects itself from the solar wind emitted by the sun with its own magnetic shield. This question of the existence of negative mass, which corresponds to negative energy states, is a problem that emerges directly from quantum mechanics. Within the Janus team, we have started to examine these issues, and a first article has been published in the digital virgin version of the Journal of Physics. Thus, this mass inversion technology will emerge from quantum mechanics extended to negative energy states. Let's try to sum up the Earth's situation. Men are like the inhabitants of a small island lost in the middle of an immense ocean who would never have had contact with other living beings. They live by hunting and gathering and have developed primitive technology. One day, they see an unidentified object flying and appearing in the sky. They obviously are unable to understand how such an object can fly. The idea that this object is a flying machine piloted by intelligent beings is viewed with great skepticism. As this phenomena does not find its place among the inhabitants of the island in an explanatory scheme, they decide to consider it as a paranormal phenomenon. The most common explanation, which eventually emerges as the most credible, is that this phenomena comes from another dimension of space and time. Indeed, every individual or group tends to install the study of a new phenomenon within the framework of its own competencies. As this phenomenon did not seem to fit into any framework, it was decided to create a new one called ufology. The, the island counted then many ufologists. It was extremely easy to pretend to be a ufologist, as this discipline had no defined content. It was not enough to say that one possessed an imaginary competence. 
The fact that this ufological approach has not produced anything tangible in more than 70 years has not hindered its growing success with a wider and wider public. Returning to this image of an island lost in the middle of a huge ocean, one of the inhabitants of the island tries to interpret one of the phenomena related to its unidentified flying object using local scientific and technical knowledge. But this interpretation may be too scientifically advanced for the other inhabitants of the island, fails to create any real interest in an attempt to go further in the interpretation of the observations. Um, he then proposed a more advanced scientific and technical solution, uh, unfortunately with no more success. By analogy, the MHD represents a first attempt to explain certain phenomena related to the unidentified flying objects. But this explanation is contradicted by the fact that witnesses do not report any airflow that would accompany this system of flight. A more sophisticated alternative solution would involve a cyclic inversion of the ship's mass. According to the mechanics linking the positive and negative masses which repel each other, when the vessel reverses its mass, the earth would then behave toward it like a repulsive object. While becoming invisible to the eyes of an observer, the vessel would then fall upwards. The opposite phenomenon when its mass becomes positive again, when a cyclic inversion of its mass, the object would then seem to escape from gravity. It should be noted in passing over that this first MHD modeling contradicts the conclusions produced in 1968 by Edward Connons in his report on the study commissioned by the Air Force at a cost of $500,000. According to this conclusion, the study of UFO phenomenon was of no scientific technical interest. It seems that the Russians have come to very different conclusions. Using and passing the results of their own study of the subject. Now here's my own personal conclusion. I gave up my MHD work in 1985, 35 years ago. So I would like to make it clear that it is out of the question for me to take over the direction of research in this field. I was born in 1937, so I'm 83 years old today. I will devote the limited number of years I have left to live to my work in cosmology, astrophysics, and theoretical physics. The goal being to conceive, with experimenters having adequate means, a different experimental demonstration of mass inversion, key, in my opinion, to interstellar travel. Since 2014, when an article on the Jan in the Janus Cosmological Model was first published in a peer-reviewed journal, followed by dozens of others, absolutely nothing has happened. During these six years, all of my proposals for presentations and scientific seminars have received nothing but silence. No press has given echo to these works, whereas the newspapers are inflamed as soon as an idea, even a primitive one, appears. You can bet, if no one does anything, that nothing will happen in the next six years either. And then I will go on to my 90 years it's a good bet that when these ideas and works are later developed under other names and with other signatures, I won't be around to witness them. Nevertheless, the Belgian mathematician Nathalie de Berg has shown that she has a very good grip on the extension of these Janus ideas in the field of quantum mechanics. She is currently a teacher in a Belgium technical school and therefore her teaching and administrative tasks leave her very little time for her research. In order for her to be relieved of this responsibility and be able to work full time on theoretical research, it would be necessary to, able, uh, to be able to provide her with a salary that represents annually 80,000 euros including charges. It can be done through the support of the Janus Association if you wish to contribute to this project, you will find the information and the link to the association's website and the information that accompanies this video. In order to give this project maximum success, this video will be translated into all languages and this request for assistance will be addressed to the international community. 
There are several scenarios to consider. Either the donations will be very important, will exceed Natalie's uh, the Berg's salary. The surplus can then be used to give a Janus Award to those who have published a really significant piece of work in a high-level mainstream journal that represents a breakthrough in the Janus model. An intermediate solution, the sum collected is not sufficient to ensure a salary corresponding to a full-time activity. A half-time will then be considered. Finally, another solution, if the sums collected are still lower, the remainder will be devoted to the Janus Prize. If you wish to contribute to this project, you will find the information and the link to the association's website in the short text accompanying this video.